It probably won't shock you to learn that I, a homosexual of refined tastes, have some feelings about Barbie, both the movie and the doll, to be honest. As a kid, I was really, really lucky to have the kind of parents who weren't going to throw a fit if I wanted to play with Barbies as well as Hot Wheels and Thomas the Tank Engine, but it wasn't just that. When I was little, I went to a childcare thing at my local swimming pool where an instructor whose name and face I cannot remember for the life of me would irreversibly influence the course of my life by constantly playing Aqua's iconic first album, Aquarium, on a loop. Age appropriate? Probably not. It is, however, an album full of bangers. And even if you don't know who Aqua is, you absolutely know the banger from this album. Barbie Girl. Hiya, Bobby. Hi, Ken. You wanna go for a ride? Sure, Ken. Jump in. Eventually, my mom gave me her copy of the album, or maybe I stole it, I can't remember, and it was one of the first albums I ever owned alongside American Idiot and Under My Skin. Honestly, you can track a shocking amount of my life today as a gay person with emotional issues and strong political feelings who plays dress up on the internet back to those three albums. However, for our purposes, Barbie Girl was also notable for another reason, being arguably one of the single most influential pop songs of all time, not only managing to significantly influence countless artists, but also significantly impacting the brand identity of one of the most iconic toys of all time. Barbie. A little over a decade later, I got into Overwatch, a game which quickly became infamous for the amount of... let's say content, that people made of its heroes before it even came out. To this day, the jokes about Overwatch as a Rule 34 factory still go pretty strong. Its characters were extremely popular searches on any website where you could post that kind of content, and after Overwatch 2 came out, artists were basically speedrunning how quickly they could hack the mainframe to get the new models for new... content. It took them less than a week. However, that doesn't mean that Blizzard has always been in love with this side of the fandom. At least not publicly. Privately, according to the artists, plenty of the people working on Overwatch are commissioning that artwork as much as anybody else is. However, publicly, it's more complicated. On one hand, you don't really want your game that's rated as being appropriate for ages 13 and up to have a reputation as a porn sandbox. But on the other, you don't really want to alienate the very large number of people who got into Overwatch and continue to spend money on cosmetics for it because they saw Widowmaker getting her cheeks clapped in 2015. The release of Barbie and the discourse around whether or not Barbie Girl would make it into the movie, and the eventual reveal that it would be on the soundtrack through a Nicki Minaj and Ice Spice collab sampling it, has lately had me thinking a lot about how audiences can take control of a character, specifically in terms of how they're sexualized and why it can be such a tightrope for a company to walk. And so, that's what this video is going to be about. Sue me for wanting to capitalize on the Barbie movie, I don't care, I love the movie and I love the song, and I finally found a way to tie it into Overwatch. So, let's talk about how corporations lose control of their characters. Part 1. The background. It feels kind of silly to think about it today, but back when Barbie Girl came out, it made Mattel fucking furious. Barbie has always had a strained relationship to the culture she exists within as a character who was originally invented to give girls an alternative to the mainstream options of the time. Namely, baby dolls that implied that girls should be prepared for motherhood from day one, by showing them an independent working woman without a husband or children. Mattel gave her the kind of body a Kardashian would drop a small nation's GDP for, but they didn't like the idea of her being sexualized. She was meant to be beautiful, but she's still a kid's toy. She's endured many a controversy over the decades, but her brand identity has probably never been so forcibly changed from the outside by anything as much as Barbie Girl, a song about an airheaded bimbo Barbie talking with a bit of a sleazy sounding Ken about how you can touch her, you can play with her, and you can say she's always yours. It's a pretty sexual song, and it really recontextualized how we perceived Barbie at the time and still to this day, and Mattel hated them for it. They sued, arguing that Aqua not only infringed on their trademark, but damaged their product's brand identity. Effectively, they were mad that Aqua had slandered Barbie by calling her a bimbo and a slut. Barbie has always been fighting the ditzy allegations, and Mattel didn't seem to know how to toe that line, especially as the culture around women changed over the product's lifetime. The 90s were especially tricky as second wave feminism gave way to third wave, and keeping everyone happy with Barbie's cultural presence continued to become even more of an impossible task. A big challenge for Barbie is a core theme of the movie, a doll that's meant to reflect what a woman could be, you know, president, pop star, princess, physician, and anything between and beyond, is also limited in the same ways women are. As America Ferreira's character Gloria puts it, You have to be thin, but not too thin. And you can never say that you want to be thin. You have to say you want to be healthy, but you also have to be thin. You have to have money, but you can't ask for money because that's crass. You have to be a boss, but you can't be mean. You have to lead, but you can't squash other people's ideas. You're supposed to love being a mother, but don't talk about your kids all the damn time. You have to be a career woman, but also always be looking out for other people. You have to answer for men's bad behavior, which is insane, but if you point that out, you're accused of complaining. You're supposed to stay pretty for men, but not so pretty that you tempt them too much or that you threaten other women because you're always supposed to be part of the sisterhood. But stand out and always be grateful. But never forget that the system is rigged, so find a way to acknowledge that, but also always be grateful. You have to never get old, never be rude, never show off, never be selfish, never fall down, never fail, never show fear, and never be out of line. 
It's too hard. It's too contradictory, and no one gives you a medal or says thank you. And it turns out, in fact, that not only are you doing everything wrong, but also everything is your fault. And frankly, Barbie has done a remarkably good job of being able to thread the needle on a lot of that over the years. It definitely wasn't like everyone was happy with her, and you could cover a continent in the discourse that's been written about Barbie over the decades from every possible angle, but Mattel has mostly managed to maintain a lot of control over how Barbie was perceived and her place in the culture at large. And then Aqua came around and wrote one of the most famous, recognizable, and influential pop songs of all time about how she wants to get on her knees and beg for some of that Kennergy. And it kind of fucked up Mattel's balancing act a little bit. Aqua countersued for defamation, with the judge dismissing both lawsuits and, quote, advising the parties to chill. A big part of why they won is that Barbie, due to her cultural presence, wasn't just a product. She represents something way, way bigger than that, and Barbie Girl was protected as a parody of not just the doll, but what she represents. However, even if Mattel had won, it's not like they could have unrung the bell. Barbie Girl had forever changed what the concept of Barbie was to the mainstream. Like, if you made a list of songs that have come the closest to being heard by every single person alive at any given point in time, Barbie Girl would probably make that list and be pretty close to the top. And Mattel can't do anything about that. On the flip side of this video's topic, you have Overwatch and Rule 34. Uh, for the unfamiliar, Rule 34 is basically just a meme about how, on the internet, there is NSFW content of everything, no exceptions. Initially, it was just a joke about how a guy was shocked to find that kind of content about Calvin and Hobbes, but over time, it's basically grown to be its own genre. Tons of websites, subreddits, and artists specializing specifically in producing, procuring, or presenting NSFW art of all the characters you never would have expected to see doing that. At this point, it's honestly less about, like, the truly unhinged shit like the Calvin and Hobbes thing, and more like, you know, nobody specifically requested that this thing exists, and yet it exists, with regards to anything that's 18+. Overwatch, as a game with a lot of very attractive characters, was a prime target for it. It's so notable that it even has its own Wikipedia page. If you want art of any of the Overwatch heroes doing anything, and especially the female characters, it's probably out there. There's not as much for the male characters in general, but you can certainly find plenty of artwork of Cassidy, Hanzo, Baptiste, Genji, Lucio, Reaper, Soldier, Lifeweaver, and a few others that definitely aren't in my search history out there too. Blizzard has had a complicated relationship to this work that's older than the game itself. The problem for Blizzard, like any company in a similar position, is that you can't just go around suing everyone who makes art of your characters. Everyone's aware of the Streisand effect by now too, and you do not want to make the situation even more of a problem for yourself. Plus, they can't stop you from, like, drawing a picture of Hanzo saving a horse and riding a cowboy, but they can get you for some other stuff. A lot of the NSFW content around Overwatch relied on using the actual Overwatch models ripped from the game, not just, like, artwork drawing or recreating them in some way. And that was something they could and did fight back against. They DMCA claimed people who took their models out of the game, put them in other software like Source Filmmaker, and made them do unspeakable things to each other. At least until they got a lot of pushback over it. The topic was so prevalent that Jeff Kaplan was even being asked about it in interviews, and he honestly seemed really unsure about how to tell people to keep it in their pants without alienating anyone. However, there was also a competing argument presented by people like James Stephanie Sterling on the Jimquisition, who said that the prevalence and popularity of this content was actually a really good sign for the game's future. At the time, she argued that it's proof that Overwatch's approach to these, you know, wacky, kooky, goofy character designs really resonated with people. After all, if the characters weren't incredibly engaging and appealing, would people really be that interested in seeing them rail one another? They're diverse, recognizable, and genuinely iconic. Not just generically sexy, but uniquely sexy. Sterling credits the game's success entirely to its characters, and I think she's right about that. I don't think it's a hot take to say, seven years after that video, that she was just right. It's the characters more than anything else that are keeping people coming back to this game all these years later, and it will inevitably manifest in both safer work and not safer work artwork. And yet, when people joke about Overwatch being a game that survives off its Rule 34 content, it's not like they're talking about Yeehan. It's the female characters who got sexualized at the time and continue to be sexualized the most, with Tracer, Widowmaker, Mei, Diva, Mercy, and pretty much every other woman from Overwatch spending time as a top 10 Pornhub search term. And while Blizzard as a company certainly doesn't treat women well, as has been established, Overwatch was supposed to be a game about how anyone can be a hero. And for a lot of people, if the predominant image they have in their mind of Mercy is her on her knees for Genji, the word that comes to mind is whore, not hero. Blizzard obviously knew about this, and they didn't want it. Not just from some altruistic philosophical position that women shouldn't be treated like sexual objects, because again, Blizzard, but also because they don't want to get a reputation for being a barely disguised porn game because that might make it seem too adult and limit their audience. There's a reason why they kind of went a bit overprotective with some stuff like Tracer's over-the-shoulder victory pose, or why they aged up D.Va so that she was 18, because, you know, they wanted to make it clear that they weren't trying to sexualize their female characters like that, and also, you know, wanted to avoid the implications of things like D.Va being underage. They wanted this to not be a story. 
Although it does kind of need to be stated that it's a little bit wild that, you know, Widowmaker executing people from long range with a sniper rifle counts as being family friendly, but the idea that she might also have sex isn't. But that's a topic for another time, because now we need to move on to part two. Why are we even talking about this? The reason I'm including both of these topics in the same video, despite being mildly different situations, is because I think both of them speak to a real challenge of maintaining a specific vision specifically for female characters. If they're perceived as too sexual, the whole identity of the character is going to be affected. But there's also a bit of an inevitable gravitational pull towards sexualizing women that threatens to drag in any female character given enough time. Rule 34 exists for a reason, after all, and it's not because the gays wanted to see more gay representation. Not that that hurts, but that wasn't exactly the main reason. And sure, male characters do also get sexualized, but a man being sexualized doesn't really come at the expense of his perceived capacity for anything and everything else. A man can be seen as hot without being seen as just hot. If you're just like an absolutely jacked man streaming in something revealing with, you know, the pecs on full display on Twitch, you can be hot and be good at the games and be considered a good entertainer without any of those being treated as inherently contradictory. A woman who does her hair and her makeup and wears something similarly revealing just doesn't get treated the same way. And if you're a woman with big boobs who doesn't, like, wear three sports bras and a sweatshirt on Twitch, forget about it. You will be accused of just using sex appeal and relying on men being horny for your content. Maybe even be accused of deliberately, maliciously trying to use your seductive feminine allure to ensnare men and bleed them dry. A woman easily becomes a succubus, but rarely does a man become an incubus. When it comes to fictional characters, it doesn't affect the character's self-esteem or anything. Like, obviously, they're fictional. But it does affect how people relate to that character, the stories that people will accept with that character, and how people will perceive the media that that character appears in. If you're telling the story of Barbie, how much will it limit that story if people's perception of Barbie is Barbie Girl? The Barbie of Barbie Girl isn't an astronaut, a president, a doctor, a lawyer, a pet groomer, or a DJ. She's not a strong, independent woman who makes her own money and lives her own life. She's a blonde bimbo girl in a fantasy world. You can touch, you can play, you can say she's always yours. She doesn't expect anything from you, and she is happy to drop everything to go get railed by the sleaziest iteration of Ken to ever exist whenever he drops by the dream house. Mattel has always had an uphill battle in convincing people that the young, blonde, attractive woman with a tiny waist, big boobs, and a wardrobe that could fill a museum wasn't just shallow or vapid, or worst, easy. And that battle probably became impossible to win after Aqua sent a song that called her all those things and more straight to the top of the charts all over the world. The irony, to me at least, is that when it comes to Barbie, that kinda is what Ken is. Every day is a great day for Barbie, but it's only a great day for Ken if Barbie acknowledges him. He's hot, he's kinda dumb, he's desperate to please Barbie, he is broadly incompetent, or at least significantly less competent than Barbie, and yet who's the one who's always accused of letting down the side for their gender? When it comes to Overwatch, who's D.Va? Is she the gamer girl who was so good she got recruited to the military and protects South Korea from the Gwisin in her mecha? Or is she the character making ahigao faces while getting railed by an incalculable number of disembodied dicks from faceless men in artwork all over the internet? Is Widowmaker the literally cold-blooded assassin who once lived the life of a talented ballet dancer and wife of a powerful Overwatch official before she was kidnapped, brainwashed, and forced to kill her own husband? Is Tracer the plucky, quirky pilot whose extraordinary talents led to her taking part in an experiment that left her dislodged from time, only to be saved by Winston and granted new miraculous abilities? Are the pair of them rivals, with Widow seeing Tracer as this annoying pest that just won't fucking die, and Tracer seeing Widow as a terrorist who plunged the fragile piece of King's Row into even more chaos by executing an omnic spiritual leader? Do people perceive them differently if they've watched and enjoyed the mountain of porn that exists to the two of them together? Does it limit how seriously they take these characters and the relationships both positive and negative between them, and as a consequence limit what kind of stories they'll take seriously in the world of Overwatch when they see half the roster as, first and foremost, jack-off material? I mean, whether you're a second wave or third wave feminist, you probably didn't look at Barbie Girl as a super empowering anthem no matter how you look at it. Barbie's relationship to feminism has been, is currently, and probably will always be pretty complicated for the reasons already explained and more. If you felt like Barbie was a good role model for girls to prove they could be anything they wanted to be, were just as competent as any man, and didn't need to make a beeline right for motherhood like a baby doll does, you probably looked at Barbie Girl and thought that it degraded the image of a strong woman. If you felt like Barbie was just a commercialized product that serves the male gaze and indoctrinates little girls into thinking they only have value as a woman if they're skinny with long blonde hair and perky boobs, Barbie Girl probably just reinforced the idea that Barbie is nothing more than a sex object masquerading as a kid's toy. Regardless of your angle, Linnea Nistrom is certainly not going to be your Leslie Gore, and Barbie Girl is not going to be your You Don't Own Me. Similarly, I can't really imagine either second or third wave feminists looking at every woman introduced to Overwatch being treated like they just walked into a Berlin sex dungeon and thinking it's anything other than a profound representation of how, when presented with the concept of a competent woman, men will immediately try and turn them into a sex object. Now, if you're Mattel in the 90s, you're probably going bald from stress as you try to figure out how you're going to keep selling Barbie accessories when the radio has been spending months training everyone to interpret Barbie has changeable outfits as you can brush my hair, undress me everywhere. 
If you're Blizzard, you're probably similarly losing your mind when it seems like every other headline about your new game, the first new IP from your company in almost two decades, is about how this game's female characters are the internet's new favorite sex dolls before the game has even been released. This video isn't going to try and explain how a company can, like, pull this back and erase it or outdo it or whatever, because honestly, you really can't. Like, seriously, what can Mattel ever do to erase Barbie Girl from pop culture? They announced a Barbie movie with Greta fucking Gerwig at the helm 24 years after the song came out, and one of the most constant questions around it was still, okay, but will Barbie Girl be in it? People were genuinely disappointed when it seemed like it wouldn't be, and then were really excited when it was revealed last minute that Nicki Minaj and Ice Spice would instead be sampling it for a new song, Barbie World, meaning that the song would still make it into the credits of Barbie. From there, though, we should probably move on to... Part 3. Time plus tragedy equals comedy. The funny thing about this phenomenon is that what once seemed really damaging can eventually become a positive. For a long time, Barbie Girl was treated as one of the most annoying songs on earth by the general public, as well as being a misogynistic song by feminists who already had a complicated relationship with the title character, to put it mildly, and a serious wound to their brand for Mattel. However, over time, people have softened on it a bit. Barbie Girl forever changed how people perceived Barbie, but you know, was that always a bad thing? The song was a colossal hit for a reason, and at the end of the day, it wouldn't have worked without it being about Barbie. Part of why the song works, in my opinion at least, is that it kinda does acknowledge that Barbie can be anything, and some part of that is sexual. Like, let the person who did not peek under Barbie's skirt or make their Barbie's kiss as a child throw the first stone here. It's not exactly as explicit as Barbie Girl is, but it is still something a lot of people identify with Barbie in a way. I'm not trying to say that all the lyrics are like, super empowering or anything like that, but I do think there is a pretty straightforward counter-argument to be made to the idea that the song undermines Barbie's competency by sexualizing her. Namely, why does it make Barbie any less capable of being an astronaut, a president, a doctor, a lawyer, a pet groomer, or a DJ, just because she also likes to relax, party, and have a good time with Ken? Like, I didn't realize that one of the conditions for becoming the American president was that you couldn't have gotten on your knees from time to time. And if we're being real, promiscuity is one of the most common attributes of American presidents across party lines. Whether we're talking JFK or Trump, you don't exactly need to be Ned fucking Flanders to get into the White House or stay there as a man, so it's kind of stupid to act like Barbie couldn't have both been sexual and president. Also, not for nothing, most people have sex over the courses of their lives, including the successful ones, and most of them enjoy having sex, most of them like thinking about it. And Barbie Girl isn't like a laundry list of the most depraved sexual fantasies. She's basically just teasingly asking the man she's been monogamously hooking up with to undress her, kiss her everywhere, and like, that she wants to get on her knees for him. It's not exactly WAP. Eventually, the whole thing just kind of becomes cute. Like, the idea that people were scandalized about Barbie Girls seems kind of silly now. Oh no, the most popular song in the world is about Barbie having a hot girl summer with her boyfriend. Call the fucking cops. Like, Mattel began incorporating Barbie Girl, albeit with some changed lyrics, into ads over time, and obviously, they eventually incorporated Barbie Girl into Greta Gerwig's Barbie as a credit song. A movie that, aside from just generally being excellent, bluntly tackles the complexities that go into being Barbie. I read Gloria's speech to you earlier, but I did leave out the beginning and end of it, which were, It is literally impossible to be a woman. You are so beautiful and so smart, and it kills me that you don't think you're good enough. Like, we have to always be extraordinary, but somehow we're always doing it wrong. And I'm just so tired of watching myself and every single other woman tie herself into knots that people will like us. And if all of that is true for a doll just representing women, then I don't even know. In the movie, Barbie's first steps into the real world are accompanied by leering men who make obscene comments about her and then hit her for literally no reason. And then when she hits back, she's the one who gets arrested, and the male cops do the same thing to her. Not just once, but twice. The second time, she's dressed in a more full-coverage cowboy outfit, and they remark that it's even hotter than the rollerblading outfit because it leaves more to the imagination. Something that feels like a bit of a call-out of undress me everywhere, imagination, that is your creation. Like, these men are openly talking about undressing her in their imaginations, it's not hard to put two and two together on that. Barbie is also openly motivated by a desire to remain perfect. In other words, in her vision of it, young, beautiful, and cellulite free. But it's not like she considers everyone who doesn't meet that standard to not be beautiful, as indicated by a pretty early scene where she meets an older woman at a bus stop. And she also has no interest in being objectified by men, and is pretty harsh about it when they try to. I've also seen a lot of reactions that kind of say that this plays into this notion of bimbo feminism, which I think is kind of true, but also misses the point, and fails to recognize why Barbie is the way she is in the movie. Like, Ken is a complete dipshit who thinks that patriarchy is something about horses, but Barbie responds to being called a fascist by sobbing and saying, I'm not a fascist, I don't control the flow of commerce or the trains, which is the sort of, like, innocent and intelligent and equal measure reaction that actually kind of embodies Barbie really well. She isn't stupid, she's just living in a world where these things aren't problems in the same way anymore. She lives in Barbie land, where yesterday was a perfect day, today was a perfect day, tomorrow will be a perfect day, and the day after that, and the day after that, and Wednesday and every other day forever will be perfect. 
She wakes up in her dream house next door to all her friends, has a perfect breakfast, floats from the roof into her car because, come on, you don't walk your Barbie down the stairs. And then she waves hello to all the other Barbies who are doing construction work or who are on the Supreme Court or who are receiving Nobel Prizes while she makes her way down to the beach. Overwatch is obviously still very much in its early days compared to Barbie or even compared to just Barbie Girl. It's hard to know what might happen as a consequence of the way that these characters have been treated and perceived. I think the early reaction to Overwatch heroes being so sexualized scared Blizzard and made them think that they needed to put as much effort into making their heroes seem, well, seem kind of like Barbie. Attractive, sure, but not sexual. None of the heroes were romantically interested in each other, and the closest thing to a couple, Roadhog and Junkrat, were basically just treated like a joke whenever it came up. However, this kind of backfired in a way. People really did care about the heroes and wanted to see them interacting, whether that was platonically or romantically or whatever, and the fact that many of them seemed to keep each other at arm's length because Blizzard didn't seem to want to lean into that only really led players to read way too deeply into what was there and make it even harder for Blizzard to maintain control over their characters and their narratives. Like, I totally understand why they wanted to try and focus on letting the characters be people first and foremost rather than leaning into the versions of their characters that were banned on Tumblr in 2018, but by swinging so hard in the other direction it left their characters to be defined just way too much by minor one-off interactions and then just left to stagnate for years. Across all their characters, there's only a very limited number actively in a relationship with anyone and none with each other, which, again, totally fine if that's just how the narrative cards fall, but it feels like it was more to do with fear over how easily that could become the defining narrative of Overwatch in the broader culture than anything else. However, over time, that's also shifted. Loverwatch is obviously a pretty big departure from this philosophy, but there's also Lifeweaver flirting with Sojourn and Baptiste, or Baptiste admitting he's into Cassidy, or Farah mentioning that she's into Mercy, and just generally more of a willingness to lean into it from the community at large. I mean, I just made a whole video about how the Florida Mayhem is posting Yeehan, and now they're posting Bastion content, which is... I don't even know what to say about that. Go wild, guys. Obviously, Blizzard is probably never going to be posting the Source filmmaker videos that people were making of their heroes, but I think they're realizing that part of the reason why things got so out of hand is that they seem to really think the best way to handle it was just trying to ignore it, let it play out, pretend it doesn't exist. The reality is that they can't turn back the ocean, but they could have, and can still, try to steer it by actually developing their characters and their relationships to one another. And look, I know a lot of people's reaction to this kind of thing is like, who cares, it's just a video game, what does it add for them to all be dating each other? And the answer is that, aside from people wanting to know what's up with their favorite characters, it can pretty easily sustain a franchise if you just let your characters make out every now and then, because a lot of people are really invested in seeing what happens next in those stories. Like, that's basically the entire business model of the CW. And considering Overwatch is still a game that struggles with telling a narrative story, it might not hurt to have that going on alongside it to keep people engaged. And that's going to take us to the last section. Part 4. Why bother taking back the narrative? Part of the thing with Barbie is that, sure, there have been a million pieces of Barbie media over the last 30 years, but most people haven't been consuming all of them to try and figure out the lore of Barbie or what her character arc has been. For a lot of people who are going to go see the Barbie movie, their only other major cultural touchstone for Barbie is going to be Barbie Girl. For a whole bunch of others, it'll be Barbie Girl in that Simpsons episode that's all about criticizing Barbie. And for still some other people, when they think Barbie, maybe they just think of the Barbs and have a correct amount of fear about pissing them off. Barbie is this omnipresent cultural symbol, but she's not Iron Man or even really Superman in terms of like having a bunch of big defining blockbuster movies or TV shows or comics or whatever about who she currently narratively is that everyone can kind of agree on. So you have to work with what you've got. And what you've got is, I'm a Barbie girl in a Barbie world. Life in plastic, it's fantastic. So, you make it a plastic fantastic world. You, you work within the concept. Greta Gerwig used real physical sets for Barbie Land rather than just CGI, and it does a lot to really enforce that this is a fake plastic world that she lives in. Margot Robbie is literally playing stereotypical Barbie in the movie, and stereotypical Barbie's only real difference from Barbie Girl Barbie is that she's not really sexually available or interested. Like, when the construction workers hit on her in the real world, she basically just says, I don't have the right parts for this, move along, this isn't what you're going to be getting from me. But she's also not exactly a career Barbie who's working any harder than Linnae was either. Sure, there's Lawyer Barbie and President Barbie and Dr. Barbie who's also a DJ Barbie, and stereotypical Barbie's always there to support them, but she doesn't really have a job in the same way. One of the really popular early clips that was used to tease the movie was Ryan Gosling's Ken talking about how his job isn't surfer, and it definitely isn't lifeguard even though it's a very common misconception. It's just... beach. 
And it's a really funny moment, you know, it, it kind of touches on how the Kens don't really have the same kind of status or even jobs as the Barbies, but when you think about Margot Robbie's Barbie, you know, stereotypical Barbie, her job is literally just to be Barbie, like to be the most Barbie, to set the tone in a way, in the most all-encompassing sense of the concept. Part of what makes the movie so brilliant, though, is that stereotypical Barbie isn't stupid. She's never presented that way. She's allowed to be both things at once. She's allowed to be an attractive woman who cares very deeply about her appearance and enjoys spending her time laying on the beach, wearing pretty clothes, and dancing the night away with her friends without the movie ever trying to argue that those things are at odds with her being very smart and being very competent and being very caring. One of my favorite lines in the movie, actually probably my favorite line in the movie, is the one I mentioned earlier where Barbie reacts to being called a fascist by talking about how she doesn't control the flow of commerce or the trains. That's not just someone who's upset about being called a name, and that's not someone who just, you know, knows the broad strokes of fascism being a bad thing. That's someone who very clearly knows what fascism is, what it involves, and then literally makes a Mussolini reference to explain why she can't be one. The Barbie movie doesn't try to make her learn a lesson about how she needs to stop caring about being pretty in order to get ahead, and it doesn't act like she should have to change how she dresses or behaves or looks or whatever to get men to treat her better. It actually kind of makes the opposite argument by pointing out it doesn't matter how Barbie is dressed, she's going to be sexualized by men like the police officers regardless, and she isn't going to get anywhere that's worth going by trying to tone herself down in order to be taken seriously by them. Also, I really don't want to spoil the final line of the movie for you if you haven't seen it yet, because you truly deserve to feel the impact of that line as it was originally intended. It's really funny, but if you've seen the movie, you know that Barbie isn't exactly incurious about some of the more human stuff Barbie Girl gets up to. I can definitely see why Mattel pushed back on Barbie Girl at the time, because it really could have gone in any number of directions after that point, but I also think it's important to recognize that the Barbie movie probably wouldn't have been what it was without Barbie Girl, because of how it shifted how Barbie was seen and perceived. Wholly removing sexuality from the equation when it came to Barbie meant that, for the majority of women, she wasn't really relatable to them past a certain point. Sure, Barbie could be anything, but Barbie also wouldn't kiss a boy in his car or fool around with him after a night of partying. So, where does that leave those girls who did? I would argue that, in the long term, Barbie Girl actually kind of did Barbie a massive favor by making it clear you could still be A-R, B-I-E, be who you want to be, even if you use the anatomy that Barbie and Ken don't have. It meant that Barbie wasn't just something you have to grow out of and leave behind to a more innocent time. You don't have to stop being a Barbie girl just because you've had a beer at a high school party or whatever. And despite this movie probably requiring Greta Gerwig to become an expert at twisting arms to get Mattel's approval for a bunch of those lines, it was probably also necessary. Barbie now has a new, definitive cultural touchstone to build out and build up from, and it's one that Mattel produced and Mattel controls. Does it change how Barbie's perceived? For sure. And is it universally beloved? Absolutely not. There are a lot of people who are very mad about the Barbie movie, and it's not just because they're unhinged weirdos trying to fight a culture war. Greta Gerwig's Barbie is going to be genuinely polarizing in a way that's not entirely dissimilar from how Aqua's Barbie Girl was. You know, both in terms of the media and the doll itself, but this time, Mattel are the ones deciding what they want to do, and that means they have a plan for building Barbie out from this point in a way that they didn't with Barbie Girl. Instead of having to do damage control and rework their plans for the brand to accommodate being sideswiped by those goddamn Danish pop stars, they get to hit the ground running from here, and that's probably really, really valuable to them. But like we've already discussed, Overwatch can't exactly stop the R34 side of their community from existing or from being prolific content creators. And honestly, at this point, I don't think anyone would ask them to. Blizzard's failure to really do anything left control of the characters in the hands of the audience, and I think that's only made it harder for them to try and tell the stories of them. You know, heroes like Roadhog and Junkrat have been left stagnant in this odd couple dynamic that isn't handled very well for so long that I don't really know where you take them from here, and even the heroes who are getting some attention are still a long ways away from Blizzard being the ones running their narratives. If the As You Are short story had come out half a decade ago, it probably would have been enough to keep it going, but at this point they've got to play a lot of catch-up. It doesn't mean it can't be done or shouldn't be attempted. They definitely can and should do it, if for no other reason than that Overwatch's characters have always been its strongest point, and they should lean into that as much as they can. Taking back some control allows them to define who their characters are, how they act, how they treat one another, and why they do the things they do. Part of the issue with trying to deliberately ignore the shipping culture side of your game, and, you know, trying to make this all very chaste and pure and, you know, Ken and Barbie, is that it leads them developing an image of those characters that divorces itself more and more from yours over time, and it makes the people most invested in your characters less interested in the narrative you're telling about them. After all, if you're seven years deep into a headcanon about Farmercy getting married with two cats and a big old dog, you probably aren't really all that interested in the version of Farah that shows up in a comic that contradicts that narrative. You might even actively resent Blizzard for popping that little balloon you'd been carrying around with you. By being willing to acknowledge that these characters are grown adults who might have grown adult relationships with one another, you give people a reason to stay invested. Like, okay, we now canonically know that Baptiste has a crush on Cassidy. How does Cassidy feel about that? Part of the issue with developing those kinds of relationship webs is that a lot of the Overwatch characters still haven't met each other because the story of this game basically never advances, but you can still create tension and a dynamic, like, you know, what's gonna happen when Cassidy and Hanzo meet if Cassidy's already with Baptiste? 
what happens if they're not together and you know Cassidy rejected Bap and now he falls for Hanzo and it's all this drama what happens if Hanzo steals Bap's man and again, I feel like I can hear the people who are saying, you know, who cares? Why does this matter? But, you know, if you don't enjoy that kind of drama, you're always free to ignore it. But a ton of people do enjoy it and really just can't pull their eyes away from car crash relationship bullshit. Plus, again, the car crash drama kind of already exists. It's just being done by fan communities who are beefing over whose headcanon is better for these characters. What I'm arguing for is for Blizzard to reclaim the narrative and take control of it so they can more coherently develop their characters, rather than leaving it as this vague mess that characters try to take apart and put back together until it looks like the archer and the cowboy kissing. Are they ever going to be able to, like, stop the SFM stuff or the lewd art or whatever? Of course not. But that's not the point. The point is to create a leash and make it clear to the audience that these are your characters and you're taking the lead here, not them. And let me be clear, I know it's not just like a super simple straightforward process, whether we're talking about Overwatch or Barbie. They can't just like wave a magic wand and fix everything. There was a quarter century between Barbie Girl and Greta Gerwig's Barbie, a movie that cost $150 million for production and at least that much in marketing. I think that Mattel wanted this to be their generationally defining Barbie moment and knew the importance of doing everything in their power to displace Barbie Girl as the average person's perception of the character. And Barbie World was the final piece of that puzzle. Nikki is a Barbie girl, and handing the song off to her and Ice Spice meant that it would instantly get a lot of buzz. The song is also frankly way more sexual than the original, which is kind of wild, but I'm betting it's a little bit deliberate, to both outshock the original as well as make it broadly unusable for radio, especially combined with how short it is. Part of what made the original so harmful to Mattel, at least in their eyes, was that it was the most infectious song possible, not just lyrically, but instrumentally. Barbie World warps and distorts the original song for the backing track, messing with Linnea's vocals, fully removing Renee's lines as Ken, and just broadly manages to capitalize on being a Barbie Girl sample without any of what made Barbie Girl harmful to Mattel's vision for Barbie. Barbie World also kind of dilutes Barbie Girl's legacy in a way that's useful to Mattel, and attaching it to the end of Greta Gerwig's Barbie instead of, you know, in the middle of the movie, makes it clear that that is the vision of Barbie that people should have in their minds, not Aqua's Barbie Girl or, you know, Barbie World's Barbie. Similarly with Overwatch, I think they've kind of started to realize that it just doesn't fix anything to treat their characters like a bunch of Barbie and Ken dolls. At the end of the day, people are going to decide to create the narrative that somebody in this cast is sleeping with somebody else. Whether it's Cassidy and Ash, Reaper and Soldier, Farah and Mercy, just somebody because that's kind of how we think about things. We think about romance, we think about dating, we think about sex because these are pretty big elements of our society. Romance and sexuality are a huge part of life in everything we do. They show up everywhere from the media that we consume to advertisements to a big part of any social dynamic, any social group, whatever. I mean, if you don't believe me, ask an asexual person about it because their outside perspective on some of this stuff can make it a lot easier to notice. And so, of course, we expect it in our media. And if we don't get it, we tend to play Barbie and Ken and just invent it. Picking up these characters, taking them out of their original settings and jobs and context, and plunking them down next to each other in a playset made of mismatched pieces from all over the place to try and tell the story that we see for them. And look, if you didn't grow up a girl, or with a sister, or maybe just fruity, it's possible you didn't know about this, but if you want to influence the way a kid plays with their dolls, you get them to watch some licensed media about that doll. If you put Barbie's Rapunzel in front of a kid who loves Barbie's, not only will they be culturally enriched, they're probably going to go and recreate some Rapunzel scenes with their Barbie's on the coffee table. Blizzard didn't really give anyone any direction. They didn't give enough story, or enough character development, or enough interactions between the roster that meant anything of significance to meaningfully sear how people perceive these characters, and that has left people to wander around aimlessly. We're in the there's not really a narrative or idea going on here, Barbie's just in her car and driving off the coffee table timeline right now, and it just makes things worse. The longer you leave a kid to see how far they can smash something across the room with Barbie in her dream car, the harder it's going to be to convince them that they can do something else with it. If all the Overwatch audience is left with is a handful of pre-game interactions and some shorts from seven years ago, they'll find their own fun, and they'll be harder to bring into the story if you ever try and do anything with it. A lesson that I think Blizzard's about to learn the hard way with the story content that's coming next season. For so long, Overwatch and its characters have been a bit of a make-your-own-fun kind of deal, NSFW content and all, and I don't know how receptive people are going to be when Overwatch's story finally returns after leaving to go pick up a pack of smokes in 2017. It might have just been too long. Then again, on the flip side, maybe it's just the entirely opposite situation. Maybe people have just been tiding themselves over with the fan-led side of things until it's finally time to dine on some official canonical storytelling. At the end of the day, what Sterling said seven years ago is still true. All that NSFW content, all that shipping culture, all that fan investment is a reflection of how much fans love these characters. It's possible that, once Blizzard gives us some actual storytelling featuring the actual characters from the game advancing the actual story, people will be like, finally, thank god, I was getting tired of having to come up with this story on my own. Regardless, what I think is interesting is how quickly companies can lose control of their characters, particularly female characters, and especially when those female characters are sexualized beyond what the creators had intended. It's kind of a no-win situation, because the better the character's design is, the more 
fully embodied the character is, the more people are going to want to see of them, and that'll include everything from, you know, little mini comics of them going to the store, to songs about them, to animations of them getting absolutely obliterated by a character from an entirely different universe. And honestly, it probably does kind of sting for the people who create these characters and try to make them more fully formed, well-rounded, three-dimensional characters rather than two-dimensional sex objects that there just seems to be this inevitable pull towards turning them into that, regardless of what they try to do with them. I think if a corporation wanted to protect their characters from this ever happening to them, they'd need to address some core cause. But what is the core cause? You know, maybe it has to do with how we sexualize women in media, particularly in gaming where women have spent a long time being perceived just as damsels in distress or as sexy lamps that you won by beating the game. Maybe it really does come down to curiosity. The same type of curiosity leads so many kids to want to see what Barbie and Ken look like naked. Maybe it comes down to a desire as adults to see the adult characters that we know, and maybe even grew up with, you know, similarly becoming more adult. Maybe the problem isn't actually the sexualization of the characters in and of itself, but the way that a female character, or, you know, a real-life woman, just existing in a way that's perceived as involving something sexual at all, is often treated as just shorthand for her being unintelligent, promiscuous, or insidious, the bimbo, the slut, or the succubus. Maybe the problem isn't Barbie Girl, and maybe the problem isn't Rule 34 Overwatch content. Maybe the problem is that a whole bunch of people think that Barbie getting on her knees for Ken makes her unfit to be president, and that's stupid. Anyways, this wasn't actually meant to be a whole long video, but it's kind of turned into one, and if I don't stop here, it's only a matter of time before I just end up rambling about the rest of Aqua's discography, so I'm gonna leave this one here. Thank you very much for watching. Be sure to like, comment, subscribe, all that good stuff the algorithm loves, and be sure to check me out on Twitch for live streams as well as on the website formerly known as Twitter or any of the Twitter clones for more. I'm still working on the Spike Chunsoft and how to tell an unhinged story video, I promise there are just a lot of games to talk about for that one, and I mean like, you've seen how long I can talk about a pop song from the 90s and SFM Overwatch videos for, so hopefully you can see why trying to talk about 9 games across 4 series is going to take a little bit. Also, the August Members Choice poll is going to be going live on Tuesday, August 1st, with these 5 topics. First, there's why didn't true crime cross over into video games, a returning topic from past months talking about why the true crime genre never really made its way into gaming the way it did with podcasts, TV, movies, and more. Next, there's positive and negative balance, another returning topic from a couple months back about different balance philosophies when it comes to Overwatch, focused on buffing versus nerfing, too strong versus too weak, and all that fun stuff. The third returning topic is the philosophy of Overwatch's heroes, the video that tied for first last month so it gets to come back again. This one would be about the philosophies of Overwatch's heroes, why they do what they do, and what it says about the game. Please note that if this one wins, it'll probably be a longer video and also will probably involve some delays. Our first new topic is Cyberpunk 2077, The Importance of Understanding Your Genre, a video about how a game that matches a genre's aesthetic but misses the mark on its themes is doing itself a disservice. And finally, Why Developers Don't Fix Obvious Problems with Obvious Solutions, another new topic focusing on why there seem to be so many situations where players can identify something as a problem and identify a solution, only to see the devs seemingly dragging their feet on fixing it. If you'd like to vote for one of these five topics to be made into a video, you can become a channel member for $5 a month by clicking the join button below. As in the past, failed topics will still come back in future months, although now that we're going up to five topics a month, it'll be a bit different. The topic that's in dead last will be sent into a bit of a limbo, with no guaranteed return date. You know, we'll, we'll figure out when to bring it back if there's room. Lastly, thank you very much to all my channel members. Insert name here, MiniQ, Olesp, Cage the Orc, Surter Z, The Afro of Doom, Enball, Xander K, Gvost, Kirby PPG, Alex Stone, Nemo the Survivor, IndyD, Destiny, Remy, Vamplin, Popsneck, Lenny Lenny, Connor, Circo, Damp Weasel, Nature Big Fan, Yoshi of the Wire, and Peggy, Catlover192, Windex the Great, Sourdough, Scarlight, and Aluma Riley. Whether you're a channel member, a subscriber, or just a casual viewer, thank you so much for watching, and I hope I'll see you around again soon.